I'm Jackie. I am a program assistant with Georgia Adopt Stream. For those of you who may not know who we are, we are a citizen science program that trains volunteers to monitor the quality, the quality of uh, Georgia's different waterways. And Confluence is our annual conference. So this is a time for us to connect and come together as a community. And this year, for the first time, it's virtual. So um, we're very excited for week two of our conference and we are just happy and thankful to have you here. All right. I am muted. So I will introduce um, our session today, which is ocean acidification. And that's gonna be um, introduced to us by Dr. Daniel Gleason. So I'll just introduce him really quick and let you guys get to know him really quickly. Um, and then I'll hand it over to you, Danny. So, All right, sounds uh, good. Danny Gleason is the director of the James H. Oliver Jr. Institute for Coastal Plain Science and professor of biology at Georgia Southern University. He got his BS degree in biology from Furman University in 1980 and MS and PhD degrees from the University of Houston. Um, his master's thesis research was conducted, conducted in Texas salt marshes and focused on the role of marshes in providing food resources to post larvae of commercially important shrimp species. For his PhD, Danny spent two years in St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands, studying mechanisms by which Caribbean corals deal with environmental stress. It was there that he and his wife, Debbie, and their two cats lived on a 30-foot sailboat. Since arriving in Georgia in 1996, Danny has maintained research programs in both tropical and temperate marine ecosystems. His recent work on Caribbean reefs has been centered on coral larval behavior and the ability of these larvae to repopulate degraded reefs. His temperate work has been conducted in and around Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary and is directed toward understanding the ecology of non non-mobile invertebrates, such as coral sponges and sea squirts that dominate the hard bottom reefs. Most recently, his studies off the coast of Georgia have focused on the ability of marine invertebrates to withstand reductions in seawater pH, resulting from ocean acidification. And in the classroom, Danny enjoys teaching courses in marine ecology and invertebrate zoology. So without further ado, turn it over to you, Danny. All right, well, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, I appreciate everyone Appreciate everyone showing up today. And uh, what I'm gonna do is, uh, well, welcome from Statesboro, Georgia. And I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, all right, let's see. All right, so, um, so today I'm gonna give you um, an overview of ocean acidification and some of uh, the impacts that ocean acidification has on, on organisms in the ocean. You'll see I've got a nice coral reef in the background there for, for you to see. They don't really look like that much anymore, but uh, this picture was taken uh, quite a long time ago. But I'd first like to start out just telling you a few things that I will not do today. Um, so this is what I will not do. Um, the first thing that I will not do is I will not promote a political agenda today. I just want people to be aware of that. Sometimes when you talk about global climate change issues, uh, it starts getting a little bit into politics, but as scientists, we take the data and we evaluate data and we reach the best possible conclusions that we can reach. We really don't care what the political, political sentiment or the public sentiment is on a particular issue. Uh, we are mainly interested in, in where the data is, is pointing. Uh, the second thing that I will not do today is, is I will not debate whether or not climate change is happening. I think we have some pretty good evidence now. Uh, we've been taking temperature data for quite some time. And you can see over here in the chart over on the right, you've got uh, temperatures going all the way back from the 1800s up to the present. And what you can see is that from about 1900, up to the present, we've had about a almost a, a two degree uh, Fahrenheit change in temperature. And so it's been very well documented that, that temperatures are increasing on the earth. So that's, that's not really uh, something we need to debate today. Uh, the other thing that I will not debate is whether or not humans are contributing to the problem. 
Um, there we've also got very good data on CO2 uh, being released into the atmosphere from fossil fuels being burned. And over here on the left, you can see uh, this is data taken from Mauna Loa. I know we've got one person here today from, from Hawaii. So uh, here's the data taken from Hawaii all the way from uh, the late 1950s to the present. And you can see we've got this um, gradual increase in, well, it's actually not very gradual. It's a pretty rapid increase in CO2 in the atmosphere that, that's contributing uh, to global climate change. This goes up to about 218, I think, and there we were at about 407 parts per million. I think right now we're somewhere around uh, 412, maybe 413 parts per million, so it is uh, continuing to increase. Uh, the other argument that you might find from, that people might give you, is they will say that yes, CO2 levels are increasing, but then they will say, but CO2 levels have gone up and down in the past, and so what do we, it's just a natural process that happens, and when people make that argument, they are completely right. CO2 levels have gone up and down in the past, but we also have some very good data that we can get from things like ice cores in the Antarctic. And if we, if we take an ice core out of the Antarctic ice, we can go back, you can see on this chart, we can go back almost a million years and we can look to see what the atmosphere was like uh, many, many years ago, because as that ice forms, you get air pockets that form in that ice that take up um, the atmosphere that was present on the Earth at that particular time. And so what you can see is from 800,000 years ago, you can see their fluctuations in the CO2 levels that we found in that ice core. But what you notice here is when we get out to the present, you can see that that, that curve just starts skyrocketing upward. And so we're seeing CO2 levels in the atmosphere now that have not been seen in the time of modern humans. So we are, we are seeing levels of, of CO2 in the atmosphere um, that from the time of the evolution of modern humans, we have just not seen on the Earth. So we really have uh, quite an unusual experiment uh, going on at the present time. Now, the last thing that um, uh, I want to I point out is that uh, there's a big question, you know, and some people make the argument about global climate change. They say, well, what if the scientists and what if all the data that we're, we're accumulating is wrong? And kind of my response to that is, well, so what if it's wrong? And it's kind of like this cartoon is, is showing here. What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? And that's kind of the way I feel about this. A lot of the issues that we're talking about and a lot of the changes that we're asking people to make to clean up the earth are only going to improve the environment and are only going to improve human health. So what's the big problem with doing that? And the other thing is that a lot of the initiatives such as renewable energy and other things that are being proposed are changes that will be of economic benefit. So I think, uh, I think this is something that, that we can always fall back on also is that if we clean up the environment even more, it's only going to lead to a better earth. You know, there's this idea, there's this um, old saying by uh, Native Americans that um, we do not, we do not inherit the earth from our parents, but yet we borrow it from our children. And so we have to keep that in mind that we're, we're borrowing the earth for, from our children and we want to leave it in a better state than it was when we got here. All right, so those are the things that I'm, I'm not going to, not going to do today. So what am I going to do? Well, here's what I hope I will do today. First of all, I hope that I will make the chemistry behind ocean acidification more understandable to you if you're not familiar with it. Um, ocean acidification is one of those issues that does not get a lot of play. And one of the reasons that it does not get a, a lot of play is because it involves chemical reactions. And many times when you start talking about chemical react reactions, people's brains just turn right off and they kind of zone out and they say they can't understand it. But I think what I'm gonna to try to do today is I'm gonna to try to make the chemistry basic enough that, 
that you can explain ocean acidification to someone else. And that's what I hope you'll do when you leave here. I hope you'll go out and tell people about this because this is a major issue. This is really the other side of the global warming issue and something that we really need to make the public aware of. Secondly, I would like to make you aware of some of the impacts on marine organisms and ecosystems. So as the oceans, as the pH of the oceans start to reduce, as they get more acidic, what impacts is that having on organisms and what types of organisms? And the, the last thing I'd like to do is I'd like to provide some recommendations on what we can all do to decrease ocean acidification. So what can we do to help this particular situation? All right, so let's, let's start with this first one. Let's take a look at, at the chemistry. And when we start talking about ocean, acidific ocean acidification chemistry, it's all got to start with the carbon cycle because under all conditions, there is CO2 that is in the atmosphere. And that CO2 is going to go several places. In one instance, that CO2 is going to diffuse into the oceans. So the oceans are going to take up CO2 and the CO2 in the atmosphere is going to equilibrate with the CO2 in the oceans. Now when that CO2 goes into the oceans, some of that CO2 is going to be taken up by the process of photosynthesis by phytoplankton and other organisms that are in the ocean. So they're going to incorporate um, that carbon that's in, their, in that CO2 into um, their bodies. And so they're going to sequester that CO2. CO2 will also be taken up via photosynthesis into the biomass on the land. So you will have CO2 taken out of the atmosphere that will go into plants and other photosynthetic organisms that are on land. And then these organisms are also going to release CO2. So there's going to be uh, respiration. So these organisms are going to respire and they're going to release CO2 into the atmosphere. Some of these organisms are going to die and they're going to start decomposing. And that process of decomposition is also going to release CO2 into the atmosphere. And everything that we're looking at over here is not a problem. This is the normal carbon dioxide cycle. So taken up by organisms, then released by organisms. And if that was all that was going on, we would be in good shape right now. But you'll notice there's this other component down here. And that's the CO2 that is in the lithosphere that's trapped in the earth, deep in the earth, and trapped in rocks in the earth. And that's ancient CO2 that might have been incorporated into organisms and other, other things on the earth that then eventually got incorporated into the rocks of the earth. And that CO2, when we pull that coal and oil out of the earth and we burn it, we then release CO2 into the atmosphere. So we're taking CO2 that is buried deep in the earth and then we're releasing that CO2 in the, into the atmosphere. So we're taking CO2 that was bound up and was not contributing to atmospheric CO2 in any way, shape, or form. And now we're releasing it into the atmosphere and we're adding to the CO2 that is in the atmosphere. So that's the problem in terms of the carbon cycle that we're dealing with right now is this human component. All right, so kind of in a nutshell, what's happening here is that the oceans are a carbon sink. So the CO2 that's in the atmosphere is going to equilibrate and diffuse into the ocean. So there's gonna be an equilibration point for the CO2 in the atmosphere and the CO2 in the oceans. The oceans, as you all know, cover a very large percentage of the Earth's surface. So it covers 70% of, excuse me, of the Earth's surface. And so if we look at how much CO2 has been taken up by the oceans over the last 200 years, we find that approximately 30% of the CO2 that has been released into the atmosphere by human activity has been absorbed by the oceans over the last 200 years. Now, decades ago, we thought this was a great thing because what the oceans have done for us is they have moderated 
the climate of the planet. By the oceans absorbing all this excess CO2 that has been emitted due to burning of fossil fuels, it has kept the earth from warming up faster than it would have if this had just been a planet without any water on it, if it had just strictly had land mass. All right, so the oceans have done a great thing for us in terms of moderating the climate. The problem down the road was that we started noticing that, that those emissions and the absorption of CO2 by the oceans was now causing the pH of the oceans to change. It was causing them to become more acidic. So if you use fossil fuels, you are contributing to ocean acidification. And I think every one of us that are on this call today, and basically every one of us on this earth, are contributing to ocean acidification. We're all guilty of this. All right, so to understand ocean acidification and understand what happens when oceans absorb carbon dioxide, we have to understand a little bit about the pH scale. So here's the pH scale. The pH scale goes from zero to 14. And you'll notice over here that the pH scale is measures the concentration of hydrogen ions compared to the number of hydrogen ions that are in distilled water. Okay, so here's pure water right here. So that's what we're measuring everything else against. So pure water has a pH of seven. Pure water is neutral. If you go, if you go up, on the scale, so you go from seven to eight to nine to 10 to 11, you get to substances that are more basic. As you go from seven to six, five on down to zero, you get substances that are more acidic. All right, and all an acid is, is something that will release hydrogen ions. And that's in a nut, in basically, in, in basic, well, in basic terms, that's what an acid is, is, a, is some kind of chemical that will release hydrogen ions. And so that's what the pH scale is measuring. Now you can see we've got listed over here just to give you some kind of perspective of the pH scale. Here are different items than, and what their pH might be. So you can see things like vinegar and lemon juice that are way down here. They have a very low pH, 2.3 to 2.9. You can see the hydrochloric acid that's secreted by the stomach lining in your body has a pH of one. It's very acidic. It makes you understand why uh, people might get things like ulcers, ulcers in their stomach. And then if you look at the under, other end of the scale, you go up here to 13 and 14, you've got things like bleaches and liquid drain cleaters, which are, are very strong bases. Okay, so what we're concerned about as far as the ocean is, we're concerned about the the water of the ocean going down, so the pH dropping. All right, so we did a little experiment yesterday because we wanted to demonstrate what might be going on and what might be going in fresh, on in fresh water and seawater in terms of changing pH. So I, I have to acknowledge um, um, my undergraduate research student here who has been my hand model, uh, Bailey Yarborough. So uh, I think Bailey's probably watching this uh, somewhere along the line. And you'll notice B uh, Bailey is holding a pH scale that has different colors on it. And here we have fresh water on the left, we have seawater on the right, and we added about 75 milliliters of water to each of these beakers. And you'll notice right now we have no color in those beakers. But what we did was we added a pH indicator solution to those particular beakers, all right? And so when we did that, what you can see is we added this pH indicator solution here, and you can see that right off, the fresh water and the seawater have different pH readings. So the fresh water has a pH, you can see it's very yellowish, it's probably got a pH around uh, six on the color scale. And then you can see the water, seawater, it's much more blue, it's probably got a pH of somewhere between eight and nine up here. So you can see very different pH levels right off in these two beakers of water. 
Now, why might that be? Well, there are a lot of ions in seawater. You've got things like sodium and chloride and carbonate and all kinds of ions that are in this water that tend to buffer the pH of seawater. When you've got fresh water, you don't have the same amount of ions in that water, so you don't nearly get the same level of buffering that you get in seawater. Okay, so then we did, we took these and we did a little experiment. And what we're going to do is we're going to mimic CO2 going into this water to see what happens, all right? So um, what's happening here is Bailey is taking a straw. You'll notice it is a reusable straw, so we will clean it and use it again. And what Bailey's gonna do is she's going to blow into this, this beaker of water for about 10 seconds and we're gonna look in to see what happens to the pH. Now, some of you may have figured out right off, why are we blowing into these, these beakers? Well, the reason that we're blowing into these beakers is because when you breathe out, you release CO2. So we're basically mimicking CO2 being dissolved into this beaker of water. So let's see what happens. All right, so I hope, I hope what you noticed there is that as Bailey blew into that beaker of water, um, blew bubbles in there, CO2, there was a very rapid shift in the pH of that water. So the pH of that water, which was originally around uh, six, dropped down, it looks like, somewhere below three. So it, taint, it changed maybe three or four pH units. All right, now let's, whoops. Let's, let's go to the next one. So now we're gonna go over to the seawater and we're gonna do the same thing. Uh, Bailey will blow CO2 into the seawater for the same length of time. All right, so approximately 10 seconds. And I, I hope what you, you saw in this particular case is that the color of that water did not really change very much. All right, so let's, let's take a look at these again. This is, this is where we started out. Um, so we had our fresh water, which was at about a pH of six. We had a seawater, which was at about a pH of maybe eight to nine. And then um, Bailey blew CO2 into those, uh, both of those beakers of water. And here's what we ended up with. And you can see the fresh water ended up with a pH of about two to three and the seawater ended up with a pH that was much closer to eight. So the fresh water changed by about three and a half to four pH units, whereas the seawater only changed maybe by about a half a pH unit. So what this shows you is that seawater has much better buffering capacity in terms of taking up acid than does fresh water. This has also been a real benefit of the oceans. Not only have they been able to moderate a lot of that climate, a lot of that temperature change, but they've also been able to take up a lot of CO2 and keep buffering and keep that seawater from changing extensively in its pH. But if you keep adding CO2 to that seawater, eventually a change has got to happen. And so let's Let's look at what that change is. Okay, here's the one for anybody who doesn't like chemistry and, and wants to zone out right now, here's your chance. Um, but for the rest of you, you're gonna be able to leave here and, under, and explain what's going on with, with ocean acidification. All right, so let's start out up here on the upper left. So here we have atmospheric carbon dioxide. So that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to dissolve um, into, it's gonna diffuse into the seawater. All right, so it dissolves into the seawater, so then you have carbon dioxide in the seawater. That carbon dioxide can react with water, and it, when it reacts with water, it, there's going to be a chemical reaction that's going to take place that's going to produce H2CO3, which is an acid. That is carbonic acid, all right? So that is the acid that is formed by the combination 
of carbon dioxide and water. And if you count it up here, if you look, you could see everything that was over here, CO2, H2O, is now over here. So you have two hydrogens here, you have two hydrogens here. You have one carbon here, you have one carbon here. You have two oxygens and one oxygen here for three, and you've got three oxygens here. So that forms carbonic acid. Now, if you think back, what we said an acid was, is an acid is any substance that can release, that releases hydrogen. And so what happens with this carbonic acid is it will dissociate in water and it will release one of these hydrogens. And you'll be left with bicarbonate ions, HCO3, and you'll have a hydrogen ion, okay? Now this is where um, the problem starts coming in when you talk about ocean acidification and organisms in the sea. This hydrogen ion is now floating around in the water and it's available to bind with other things. Something else that's floating around in the water are carbonate ions. Now, if an animal is going to make a shell or an animal is going to make a skeleton, it is going to need carbonate to do that. And the way that it makes a shell or it makes a skeleton is that carbonate will combine with calcium, which is in the water, to make calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate is the base molecule that you find in shells, you find in a lot of coral skeletons, and you find in many other organisms which make various types of shells and skeletons. Now the problem with ocean acidification is that in this case you're adding more hydrogens to the environment and those hydrogens are competing, competing with calcium for the limited amount of carbonate that is available in the oceans. And in fact, this carbonate will combine to this hydrogen much more easily than this carbonate will combine with this calcium. So what happens is this carbonate combines with this hydrogen and you're left with a bicarbonate ion. And that bicarbonate is no longer available to things like snails and corals and oysters and other organisms that need carbonate to build a shell or build a skeleton. So that is the problem right there. Hydrogen that's released from this carbonic acid is going to compete with calcium for the limited amount of, limited amount of carbonate that's available in the environment, okay? So adding CO2 decreases the availability of carbonate, but organisms need carbonate to produce shells, okay? So if you leave here with anything in terms of understanding ocean acidification, it is really my hope that you will understand that this is what we're worried about and this is the real problem. There's just not enough carbonate ions around for organisms to use to build uh, shells and skeletons. All right, so that takes us back to the pH scale and I just wanna give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about ocean acidification um, what kind of changes in pH are we talking about? Well, if you look up here, here's seawater. The pH of seawater right now worldwide on average is about 8.1. Just a decade or so ago, the average oceanic pH was 8.2, right? Now it's predicted that the oceanic pH by the year 2100 will drop down to 7.6. Okay, so there's going to be a decrease in pH of about 0.5 pH units. And that may not seem like a lot, but one thing you have to remember is this scale that's over here on the left, the pH scale is a logarithmic scale. So that means for every one unit change in pH, that's a tenfold change in the number of hydrogen ions. So it's a really, really big change. So changing from 8.1 to 7.6 is a very significant change in the pH of ocean water. Now something else that I, I also want you to notice is that when we talk about ocean acidification, in some ways it's a little bit misnamed, 
because you'll notice here we're still in the seven range. So it's really, the water's still neutral, all right? So when we talk about ocean acidification, what we're talking about is we're just talking about the pH decreasing. So we're going towards the acid end of the spectrum. Okay, so let's then take a look at, at what organisms might be impacted by, by ocean acidification. Why are, why are we worried about this? All right, well, some of the organisms that are going to be impacted are pretty obvious. One of the ones that's always brought up are these guys. Okay, this is a coral reef. This is a coral reef in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see all of these organisms out here. All of them are reef building corals. All of them have skeletons made up out of calcium carbonate. And experiments have shown that these corals, many species of corals, are impacted by reductions in pH such that they can't grow at the same rate that they were able to in the past and some of them may even start dissolving. All right, now the fact that you have impacts on uh, corals is not only a problem for corals, but it's a problem for other organisms that use those coral reefs for some purpose. And this could include very charismatic organisms that, that we all think about, things like sea turtles. It can include things like uh, Nemo, you know, your, your anemone fish that you can see here. These organisms use the reef as habitat, so they use it for the complexity of the reef, they use it for food, and so if this reef degrades, it has an impact on many other organisms. There are a lot of other organisms that are not so charismatic, things like this nudibranch, which is basically a snail with no shell. Um, it's a smaller organism, but this organism is dependent on the reef to, to exist. Things like this giant clam. So you can see the clam right here. This is the inside of the clam. And then you can see the shell on the outside. This clam lives within the reef system. And so it's dependent on it for its livelihood. We have the same kind of thing that happens off the coast of Georgia. And as um, was brought up in the introduction, I do a lot of work out of Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. And one of the things that we notice at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, which is about 17 miles off the coast of Georgia, is that we've, we have these, most of the bottom out there is sandy, but then we have these areas where you have these rocky outcrops, rocks stick out at the bottom. And what we find is that if those rocks are heavily covered by invertebrates, then we have very good uh, fish populations, things like these black sea bass that you see here, thrive in areas where you've got good invertebrate populations. Well, one thing we know is a lot of these invertebrates out here, things like these sponges and these sea squirts and various bryozoans and, and hydroids, they are potentially affected by decreases in pH. So if you have declines in, in these invertebrates out on these reefs, it also may impact the fish populations that you have out there. All right, so some of the organisms that I've been bringing up here, things like the, the coral reefs and the invertebrates that are on temperate reefs that you see here, these are known as foundation species. And this was a term that was coined back in 1972 by an ecologist, Paul Dayton. And what foundation species are is they are species that have a much greater impact on the composition of a com community then would be expected based on their abundance. So they may be on fa fairly low abundance, but relative to their abundance, they have a great impact on what organisms are, be able, to, are able to exist there and what the composition of that, that community is like. So if we start impacting these foundation species, such as we have done in a lot of these uh, systems through things like ocean warming and ocean acidification, it can have cascading effects on the organisms that, that depend on these areas. Just to give you an example, here's a, a nice coral reef, and I, I mentioned this earlier when I put the original slide up there, the title slide, I said the reefs don't really look like this anymore. So here's a picture of a reef in Central America. This is in Belize and in um, 
the mid 1980s. And here's the same, whoops, wrong slide. Anyway, let me, there it is right here. So um, here's the reef in um, the, the early 1980s. And then here's that same reef um, just a few years ago. And you can see over here on the left, we've got all kinds of complex habitat. We've got all kinds of good resources uh, for organisms to use, fish and other species to use. And you can see over here on the right, all that complexity of the reef system has been destroyed. And it's very likely, very unlikely that that system is going to recover if the oceans continue to acidify because it's going to make things like building the skeletons of the reef building corals very difficult. So when we have foundation species decline, we often have ecosystem decline. And that's what we've seen in areas like coral reefs. Closer to home, we have uh, here in Georgia, we have foundation species. Uh, many of you are familiar with oyster reefs that occur in the salt marshes around here, both the oysters and the salt marsh, salt marsh grass that occur in salt marshes are considered foundation species. And foundation species can also provide protection from storms. And so oyster reefs and Spartina provide a good storm protection when, when we have things like tropical storms, various hurricanes that come through these areas. But um, oysters, depend on the correct pH to produce their shells. So if that pH uh, continues to change, it may impact the ability of oysters to continue to grow and occupy these areas. Um, and this may impact some restoration activities uh, that we carry out. Here's an example of a type of activity that we've been carrying out over the last few years. We've volunteered with the uh, South Carolina DNR in their oyster reef restoration program. And so what we do is we take a bunch of students and we go out and we load up um, 12 or 1300 pounds worth of oyster shell in bags and we take it out and we put it in areas where, where uh, erosion is taking place and where uh, the marsh is starting to erode away and the, the, the marsh grass is starting um, to be taken away. And you can see we stack these up and we make an artificial reef. And then what happens is, is, is new oysters come in and they settle on that artificial reef and it allows sediment to pile up behind the reef and allows the marsh to extend back out. Well, if we carry out these types of programs and we have continuing decreases in pH, uh, these programs may be all for naught. It may, um, they may not work because uh, the oysters may not be able to come in and settle and grow. All right, so those are, so those are some of the effects that, that are pretty, pretty obvious. Um, there are some other effects that are not so obvious, and these might be some of the more in, inconspicuous organisms or structures in organisms that we don't normally think about. So here's an example right here. This is the sand striker. This is a, a very impressive organism. You can see it over here on the right, pulled out of the sand. The sand striker can be up to 10 feet long. Uh, we have them in Georgia, just so you're aware. And you can see the sand striker has these jaws that come out on either side. And these jaws are made of chitin. And so what the sand striker does is it lives in a tube down in the sediment. And it sits there and it waits for things to come over the top of it. The sand striker does not have eyes. But what the sand striker has is it has eye spots so it can kind of see shadows that come over the top. And then what it'll do is it'll clamp down on prey. Well, these, these uh, jaws are made of chitin and it's been shown that if you get reducing pH, these jaws, chitin does not get deposited as well. So it could affect things like the development of these jaws. Now, the sand striker is not the only thing that produces chitin, things like shrimp, crabs, a lot of organisms produce chitinous skeletons and so they could be impacted. Just to give you an idea of what a voracious predator this sand striker is, here's an example, whoa, there he goes. You can see this, um, this innocent little cardinal fish coming along, sand striker grabs him with the jaws and pulls him right down into the substrate. Now, the sand striker also has the, um, 
nicknamed the Bobbit Worm. Um, some of you may remember an event that happened a few years back, and that's how, um, with a particular couple, and that's how uh, the Sand Striker got that, got that nickname. All right, there's also um, another structure that, that people may, may not think about are uh, fish otoliths. Fish have ear bones. And here you can see a striped bass. And you'll notice in the head region, right here, there are structures called otoliths. And here, the otoliths have been dissected out of this particular fish. And these otoliths contain carbonate. So they need carbonate to grow. Now the otoliths are very important to the functioning of this fish. So the otoliths are very important for the balance of the fish. And what we found is that in some sp fish species, if the pH of the water drops, these otoliths cannot develop in the correct manner and it affects the ability of the fish to function. So this is a, another concern and kind of an unexpected concern um, that people have about decreasing pH of waters. All right, there are also um, some effects that are at the base of food webs. And, and this is definitely a concern because it could cause impacts in all the way up the food web, affect organisms all, from, all the way from the base level to the top predators. A good example are these organisms called pteropods. These are very small planktonic snail, snails. And you look at them and you go, they're snails, but where's their shell? And they really don't have a lot of shell. They do have some shell, but the shell over evolutionary time has been much reduced. You can see some internal shell here. You can see some internal shell here. But the shell is very important for their function. And there have been studies that have been done to show that shell development in pteropods is affected by decreasing pH. Uh, one of the classic studies that was done was one where um, pteropods, and you can see this is a species of pteropod that looks much more like what you would think of as a classic snail, although the, the uh, shell is very thin and it's very light. And what they did was they took these pteropods and they put them under increasing concentrations of CO2 in the water. As the CO2 increased, the pH decreased. And so this individual over here is under normal pH conditions and CO2 conditions. You can see a very well-developed smooth shell. You start increasing the CO2 and decreasing the pH. You can see you start getting striations in the shell and some pits in there. And if you, and if you decrease the pH enough, what you notice is that the shell really becomes malformed. You can see the edge here is very racked, all kinds of pits in the shell. And so this individual um, probably will not survive. Coccolithophores are another group of organisms that may be affected by, um, and we know from experiments are affected by changes in pH. Uh, they are small photosynthetic algae, very important parts of the food web. They become a, so abundant sometimes that you can see their blooms from space. Um, the, the blooms are so huge. If you take these coccolithophores and you, um, and you put them under, um, you put them under different concentrations of CO2, so you change the pH, what you'll notice is that these, this particular photosynthetic algae requ requires calcium carbonate plates produces calcium carbonate plates that actually make the structure of the algae. If these plates do not form correctly or they're not positioned correctly, then the algae cannot survive. And so what you see here as you increase the concentration of CO2 in the water, basically decrease the pH, you can see that those plates get malformed and then they can't group together correctly. All right, and finally, I just want to say there are direct economic costs now. Um, we've seen this in Pacific oyster farming. There's a group out there, Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms. Uh, for years, they've been raising oyster larvae for uh, culture. And in 2007, they started noticing that their larvae 
they were having much higher larval mortality. And this is a shellfish industry that's uh, more than two billion a year, and they've had really decreased production. And in the future, it's estimated that the cost of the world economy by the year, 20, by the year 2100 may be as much as one trillion or more per year in terms of uh, productivity, in terms of, of all kinds of issues related to aquaculture and, and food. All right, so, so that's ocean acidification and that's what it is. And I'm just gonna finish up with a few minutes here to talk about what can we do, all right? Those are all the problems that, that, that are being caused by ocean acidification. How can we change the needle? How can we move the needle in, the other, in another direction? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that, please, I'd ask all of you to please have confidence that scientists are not promoting a self-serving agenda. There seems to be a real atmosphere out there that people think there's a, a group of people that are promoting that scientists are really into, in this whole global climate change scenario to get rich. And I can vouch for it. There, I know no one um, who's studying questions related to global climate change who is becoming extremely wealthy. Um, most of the people are out there just trying to do the best job they can do and trying to um, get as much information they can so we can manage this in the future. Please also realize that scientists appear wishy-washy. If you're a trained as a scientist, you know this. We're always taught that there's another explanation. So if we get the question, is it without a doubt that the earth is warming up? We will say, yes, all of the best evidence that we have to date indicates that the earth is warming up, which someone who is in the news field might consider to be a little wishy-washy. Well, you didn't say definitely, all right? And we don't normally do that because we always think there may be another hypothesis that could be addressed. But trust me, uh, scientists that are out there uh, firmly think that the evidence for global warming and ocean acidification is very, very strong. All right, what can we do? Well, we know we can lower our CO2 emissions now. I think all of us realize we have an impact. So what we can do is reduce our ecological footprint. You guys know what a lot of those things are. You can, you can uh, consolidate trips, you can turn lights off, you can there are all kinds of things that you can do to reduce your ecological footprint. One thing that I think would be a great thing for all of us to do if you haven't done it already, um, there are ecological footprint calculators. Uh, there's one out there called, w, uh, called Footprint Calculator. And here you can see the website for that. It's just footprintcalculator.org. And if you go there, uh, you can put in uh, how big your house is, how much you drive, what kind of mileage your car gets, and it will tell me, tell you, if everybody lives like you live, how many Earths are we going to need to support you? And so please go out and do that and see where you fit, and it'll give you ways that you can actually cut back. All right, now one way that we don't think about often that we may be able to cut back on our ecological footprint is we can change our diet. Uh, what this particular graph is showing right here is it's showing on the other side of this dashed line, you've got plant-based diets. And over on the right side, you've got animal-based diets. You can see, um, we see how much use there is in terms of land use, freshwater consumption, and emission of CO2 in terms of land use change and agricultural production. And by far, the greatest impact in terms of diet, diet items is eating beef. So if you eat a lot of beef, you're having probably the greatest possible impact you can have on the planet relative to any other food source that you could eat. So if you wanna change your diet, uh, if you wanna have an impact on, on global climate change, probably the, one of the first things you could do is try to eat more plant-based diets or even cut down to eating more fish or eating more poultry because they have a much lower impact. All right, um, the other thing that we can do is reduce land-based contributions. So um, reducing the inputs of nutrients and organic carbon. Uh, if you are fertilizing your lawns, I know people love beautiful lawns, but 
lawns are just do extensive damage to the environment. If you can replace a lot of your grass with shrubbery that may be uh, drought tolerant, more resistant, please do that. Stop using fertilizers on your lawns because those will wash off uh, during rain and then they will end up in going into um, rivers and eventually all those things end up in the ocean. And please promote research on the effects of CO2 and pH on organisms. We really need to know how ocean acidification, we're, we're still in our infancy and in, in understanding how ocean acidification is going to impact uh, organisms on the earth. So please promote that. And in blatant self-promotion, I'll say that in our lab in the last several years, we've been able to establish a pretty decent ocean acidification research lab. We've now got um, using various computer technology and other things. We can control pH and temperature in 16 different aquaria at a time. It allows us to study things like this uh, temperate coral that occurs off the coast of Georgia that you can see here. All right, and finally, please educate everyone. I hope I've helped you understand ocean acidification, that you might have a little better understanding of it and what's going on in terms of ocean acidification. If you do have a better understanding of it, please go out and educate everyone you know. I would like to thank Stephen Colbert for coming up with the term peekabooologist. Peekabooologist is a great term because a peekabooologist is that person who goes out one day and it's very cold or there might be a cold winter and they go, see there, global warming is dead. It's kind of like a child who goes, see, I'm here, and then pulls the towel over, towel over and goes, I'm not here, and then pulls the towel away and goes, I'm here. All right, remember, with global climate change, we're looking at long-term averages. So a single year where you have cold weather or hot real weather does not really decide what is happening over the long term. So please, let's decrease the number of peekabooologists that are out there. And I think I'll stop there. That's my time. I'd like to thank you for showing up today, and I really hope you, you learned something. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. Let me change this back to gallery view here. There we go. That was such an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. I feel like I really, I've never been very much of a chemistry person, so <laughs> that was me when you said that in the beginning, but I really felt like I got an actual understanding of what that looks like, and I don't know, seeing kind of the small all the way to the big picture was really incredible, so thank you so much. Well, thank you, Bailey. Yeah, and your, uh, your student, Bailey, that was kind of, I was like, me? Well, am I featured here? Yeah, so. And, uh, I've been getting emails from both of you, and so they get like, wait, so. A little confusing. Well, yep. thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so. If, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if anyone has any questions, please use that Q&A function, and um, we can facilitate that for you. Yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. Um, they come up. Apparently Jackie Miller is correct. I had very clear explanations and nobody <laughs> has. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Ooh, okay, we have a question. Okay. It came in from Christina and she wants to know, does ocean acidification affect different oceans at a different rate? Uh, Christina, that is a very good question because um, it's a very complex question because, because we make the statement that the current oceanic pH is 8.1. We make that statement and that is the average across the entire Earth. If you go to different locations, you will very much find that there are different pH levels in different places. The, the, the coast of Georgia is a very good example of that because we have so much productivity in our salt marshes and we have so much organic material and other things that, that get pushed offshore 
we will get very low pH water that occurs off our coast. If you, and, and there's a monitoring system that's being um, conducted by Scott Noakes, who's at University of Georgia, offshore, what you can find is that off the coast of Georgia, pH will vary in the summer from about 7.9 pH, and then in the winter we'll go to about 8.1. So, so we have seasonal fluctuations in pH. So really the, 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 uh, the whole story is much more complex um, than, than what I laid out here. So that's really a good question, but that allows us to have a lot of organisms which are being exposed to low pH at certain times of the year or in certain locations that we can study to see how they've adapted to it. Awesome, thank you and great question, Christina. And um, we do have a question from Brittany. She wants to know, is this problem relational to acidification in natural streams? All right, that's, a, that's another excellent question. And, and there are uh, streams vary a lot in their, their pH. Um, as as uh, you may know, Brittany, things like uh, Blackwater rivers have, are very low pH systems. Um, and you can look in some of these freshwater systems and if you pull organisms out of them, you might notice that if you have things like snails in those systems, if they come from a low pH system, that their shell may be much thinner and more fragile than if they, they come from another system. So it really varies on the system that you're looking at, uh, the organisms that are native to that particular system, and how they've been able to evolve to deal with the, the, the differences in pH that occur. There are mechanisms that organisms can use to change the pH in their fluids that will allow them to better produce calcium carbonate. And, and so those are some of the adaptations that we see in, in um, some of the freshwater organisms and some of the marine organisms. But yes, there, there can be similar impacts in freshwater systems. All right, so where, where does the carbonate come from initially? Yeah, and uh, um, and why is it a limited resource? So that's Cecilia Nachtman, and um, the a lot of the a lot of the ions and other things that um, end up in the oceans um, have come from the land mass. Is is where that carbonate comes from? I'm afraid that. Why it's limiting? I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. So I'm gonna have to, does anybody else know the answer to that? That's one I will have to look up when I get off this call, thank you. It's always a good talk when you get a question that you can't answer. That's true, we're all learning something. <laughs> all right, are there any further questions? Regina says, I think it has to do with the parent rocks, but I'm not positive. No clue. Maybe we'll, we'll have to check into it after the session. Maybe Dana, we will you, can, have to do that. <laughs> you can let us know what you find. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Well, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll just kind of start with our closing remarks, but we can always answer more questions as well. Um, let's see. So just to remind you guys, um, we do have a Confluence 2020 Facebook group, which um, is great for questions like this. When we don't quite know the answer, we can put them there and see what other participants know and then share the information that we've learned. So feel free to, to join that group and use that to connect and learn more. And you can um, like our Instagram and Facebook pages to keep up with us. And there are lots of more sessions coming up as a part of Confluence this year. Um, they go through the whole month of August. So check out our conference schedule and register for some more to learn more. And then um, this session, along with all of our others, are going to be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel online. And links will be available on our resources and recording pages for you to view at a later time. And Jackie. Yeah, Jackie, just put all those links in the chat. Sorry. 
Being and I just, I just like to say there's a great comment by Christine McKay that says it's uh, in the chat room that says it's also important for the public to know we are still learning and don't know everything. And that's, that is true. That is a, a very important point that we are, we are learning constantly. But that's what makes life so exciting is that there are all these new questions to address. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we also have our silent auction going on for the rest of the month of August. So if you haven't already, you can follow the link in the chat or find uh, the link to the silent auction on our website. There are tons of items up for bid right now. We have tickets to the aquarium, the zoo, we have mountain cabin getaways and packages to wineries. So uh, lots of options for everybody. And then at the end of this webinar, you're gonna be redirected to um, a post-session survey. Um, it's just a brief five question survey. If you have um, some time, we appreciate your feedback. And if you have any questions about Adopt-A-Stream or want to get involved, uh, feel free to send us an email and that is also in the chat. But yeah, I don't see any other last questions. So thank you everybody and thank you Danny for, that was really a great talk. I really enjoyed it and learned You're a welcome. lot. So thank, I, thank you for I, inviting me. <laughs> yes, thanks for joining us and everyone have a great evening. All right, thank you.